All right, we're back again, guys. I'm Kaylin Angloss. Today, I want to talk about adaptations to anaerobic training. Last time, uh, we made a video on adaptations to aerobic training. I suggest you go look at it. Today, I want to talk about adaptations to anaerobic training. Um, anaerobic means that you're creating oxygen, you're creating ATP, pardon me, energy without oxygen present. Anaerobic, no oxygen present. That's what it means to be anaerobic. So we're talking those short bursts, high intensity outputs, sprints, weightlifting, all those really quick high intensity outputs, those are anaerobic training. And when you train mostly anaerobically, um, you're gonna have adaptations that happen in your body to allow you to do that better. Just like you do if you're aerobic, you're gonna have the same, or, well not the same adaptation, but you're also gonna have adaptations to allow you to perform better in these anaerobic high intensity outputs. And that's what I wanna talk about. When we do anaerobic high intensity performance, we're mostly looking at type two muscle fibers the fast twitch muscle fibers. That's what we want, um, working to the most efficient possible to be able to perform these with high outputs and all that kind of stuff. So it's the type two muscle fibers that are mostly used for anaerobic performance. And we have two different kind of sources of fuel for, for anaerobic performance. The very quick boom explosive movements, that's creatine phosphate or creatine phosphate or creatine. That's what's used for those explosive movements. And secondly, we're looking at glucose. Carbs, that's what's gonna fuel you through your anaerobic performance. Um, so these two things combined help with anaerobic. But when we train anaerobically for long periods of times, these are some things that your body adapts physiologically to allow you perform better. The most, I shouldn't say the most important, but one of the most important ones is an increase in what's called cross-sectional area. So I'm just gonna put increase CSA, that means cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area is the area in the muscle, the deep tissue, the deep physiological cellular parts where we're making what's called cross bridges. Don't worry about it too much, but basically that's how your muscle contracts. You make, you have an actin filament, a myosin filament, they, can, they come together to make a cross bridge, they pull on each other, and that's what contracts your muscle. This is called cross-sectional area. The more of those cross bridges you have, the more cross-sectional area you have, the more force you can generate, the more weight you can lift, and the harder you can push, the faster you can go. So the more cross-sectional area you have, which gets improved through training, these adaptations happen that you're gonna be able to perform better. So that's one of the most important ones is the cross-sectional area. The other thing is looking at the fuel. I told you glucose was an important fuel, as is creatine. Well, both creatine phosphate and um, glycogen, so stored glucose, are increased through training. So we have increased glycogen content. Glycogen is stored in your liver, but it's also stored directly in your muscle. So when you increase the stores of glycogen, your glucose stores, glycogen, when those are increased, that means there's more fuel sources there to be able to carry out these different movements. That's going to be important. Another thing that's going to be important, just like with everything else that we've talked about, is the enzymes. So when you train, you actually get more efficient, what we call glycolytic enzymes. These are the enzymes that allow you to perform fast, powerful muscle contractions. You need to have enzymes, these glycolytic enzymes. Being trained, you have more of them, your body's more sensitive to them, and it just helps with that uh, performance. Another thing that we talk about with training is motor unit recruitment. What that means is that motor units are, are, are a set of muscles, basically are muscle fibers that carry out the movements. When you are more trained, you are more efficient with your motor unit recruitment. So it happens a little bit faster. The patterns of recruitment are more familiar. So that means that you can make these contractions quicker and they're more powerful. So increasing uh, that as well. And finally, one other thing that I wanna talk about is your buffering capacity. So training will increase your buffering capacity. What the heck does that mean? Well. What happens when you train anaerobically is you get a buildup of something called lactate. Now, we're not gonna to talk too much about lactate. In fact, I have another video about lactic acid production. You should go watch that as well. However, when lactate is produced, we get hydrogen ions. And what this means is that's what makes your body sore when we have a drop in, or sorry, when we have more hydrogen ions, that means we have a drop in, uh, in pH levels which is gonna actually decrease the performance in this. So we don't necessarily, lactate isn't the bad guy, but we don't necessarily want that process happening. When it does, it's because of the hydrogen ions. But if we can buffer those hydrogen ions with sodium bicarbonate, that's actually gonna help 
uh, not fatigue so quickly. That means you're gonna be able to keep up your contractions for longer period of times. And somebody who's, who's very highly trained has a good buffering capacity, which means that they're not gonna be able, they're not gonna fatigue so quickly from some of these things. So these are some of the reasons why anaerobic training uh, can help be improved is through these adaptations. These are anaerobic training adaptations opposed to aerobic training adaptations. Again, we're looking at type 2 muscle fibers and we're looking at that glucose which is fueling us and these are the reasons why we can improve that. So let me know what you think guys. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comments below. Send me an email, kaylinanglos at gmail.com. I love talking about this stuff so let me know guys. Thanks for listening.